All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Bruno Yoon. I'm one of the Athenaeum fellows this year. So there was this journal article I read once that dealt with equality of opportunity in the context of education policy, but I feel like it's very relevant here for reasons I'll describe shortly. It's called Whom Must We Treat Equally for Education Policy to Be Equal? It's by Christopher Jenks. I feel like it's relevant because it captures most of the stances people are going to take tonight, particularly with economic policy. That's right, I'm going to literally read some political philosophy for, to you. And, and in particular, this um, it, it lays out five different definitions of equality of opportunity because it's a very popular buzzword, but people mean different things by it. So the first is simple democratic equality where everyone gets treated the same and gets the same amount of resources regardless of how better or worse off they are beforehand. And the second and third are closely related. The second is weak humanistic justice, which emphasizes helping the worst off, but doesn't require you to correct for every disadvantage. Its cousin, though, strong humanistic justice, does require correcting for every disadvantage and focusing your attention on even the most seemingly irredeemably worse off. And the fourth is moralistic justice, which wants to reward based on moral virtue. Importantly, this view focuses on intentions rather than consequences. And finally, the fifth is utilitarianism, which wants to reward based on consequential merit. It focuses on consequences over intentions. All right, that's, that's enough from me. So here tonight, we have Stephen Moore, who is going to talk a bit about equality of opportunity and what it means. And during the 2016 presidential campaign, he served as a senior economic advisor to then candidate Donald Trump. He's a senior economic analyst at CNN, and he was also at Fox News. He also wrote on the economy and public policy for the Wall Street Journal. He was a member of its editorial board. And he advised the National Economic Commission in 1987, and he served as a research director for President Reagan's Commission on Privatization. So a couple quick things before this starts. A bit of, shall we say, uh, central planning from the Athenaeum. <laughs> so audio and visual recording, strictly off limits. And my last request, please silence and put away your cell phones. This talk will last about 45 minutes or so. That gives us about 30 for Q&A. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Stephen Moore. Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you so much for inviting me to Claremont. Um, this is a real thrill for me, and uh, what a great school you have, and you students should be very privileged, feel very privileged to go to a great, such a great university. Um, I, uh, I wanted to start by giving maybe four pieces of advice for you, uh, and then get into a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit about Trump and, uh, and, uh, and what he's doing on the economy, why he's doing it, and, uh, but let me start with some advice. Um, because I've lived a pretty charmed life. I've, I've uh, been really lucky in my career to do things that have been really cool. I've been, you know, work, work for the Wall Street Journal editorial page and, you know, got to, uh, you know, work on a presidential campaign and uh, started the first super PAC in the country and, you know, have just worked two of the great think tanks in the country. And I've always loved what I do, you know, so that's a great thing to be able to love what you do. And so the first piece of advice to you, to you all as students is, you know, um, don't, do what you love, do what you love. Um, and you know, if you do what you love, you'll be good at it. Life is too short, you're gonna spend, you know, hopefully you're gonna spend two thirds of your life at work, right? <laughs> hopefully you'll be working. And, uh, and you know, life is too short to do something you don't like. And sometimes people, I see people your age, make the, make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm gonna do this because this offers me more money out of college than this does. And then you get off on a path and you're like, I don't even like doing this, you know? And so, number one, do what you love. And by the way, that doesn't mean, look, what I wanted to be when I was 12 years old was a race car driver. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that you're gonna, you know, be realistic about your dreams, but, but follow your dreams and do what you love. Second of all, and this is probably a self-serving thing to say given my background, but if you want to be the smartest person in the room, um, each morning when you have your Starbucks coffee, read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Yeah. Now, uh, and by the way, I know that many of you are very liberal in this, uh, in this room, but one of the reasons to read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, because you may not, if you're liberal, you're not gonna agree with a lot of the thoughts, although they do, you know, they do have you know, liberal commentators on the page, but they're just, it's a good way, like just reading the three editorials, I used to write those, they have some of the best writers in the country and they pr pr provide a pretty good synopsis, synopsis of what's going on, whether it's on, on the economy, finance, politics, politics, culture, and so on. Um, the third part piece of advice I want to give you is um, that sometimes in life, and more often than you would think, expert, the quote experts are completely wrong. 
are completely wrong. In fact, that's one of my takeaways from the, you know, what, what, what I always tell people, like, what is the big takeaway from, the, from uh, Trump winning the election? It's that every single L expert had it wrong. Every political prognosticator had it wrong. Every pollster had it wrong. Every talking head on TV had it wrong. Every one of them had it wrong. You know, it's all... Donald Trump has a 2% chance of winning the election and so on and so forth. And these are people are supposed to be experts, and they were, they were wrong. And that happens a lot in life. That happens and people say something is certain to happen, whether it's in science or whether it's in finance or business or politics. Just because an expert says something is going to happen doesn't mean it, it will. Um, and those, are, I think, are uh, important uh, life lessons. And the most important one, because I feel so strongly about this because uh, of your generation, which is um, that freedom and liberty are precious things, are precious things. And we're so, we're so lucky to be in America. This is the greatest country in the world, no question. In my opinion, there's no, there's no one even close to the greatness of this country. And what makes our country great is we are born in a culture of liberty and freedom. And that's why everyone in the world wants to come here. It's so great to look in this room and see uh, you know, I can see people of different cultures and people who come from different countries. That's because people want to be free and they want to have liberty. And don't give up your liberties. Don't give up your freedoms. I hear your generation talking about, oh, I want to have the government more power over this and this and this and this. When you do, why do you want to give your power to politicians? I, I spend every day of my life with politicians. They're horrible people. <laughs> you know, you don't want to, you don't want to give those people authority over your life. We were having a great discussion at dinner and someone asked me, you know, what, about my political philosophy and how did you, how do you become, uh, you know, more on the right, and I said, you know, because from the, from the time I was six years old, I, I hated people telling me what to do. You know, I wanted, I wanted to have control of my own life. I didn't want, you know, so I'm kind of libertarian in my philosophy. But please, 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 when you think about political issues and so on, think about, is this going to make me more free or less free? And, you know, hopefully we will continue to be the land of the free. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about, uh, let me, I, I give a lot of speeches. I just wrote this book that came out about a month and a half ago uh, called Trumponomics, an inside view of, of, of Trump's economic plan. I helped uh, write the plan with uh, my buddy Larry Kudlow, who's now the chief economist over at the White House. And we got involved very early in the campaign with Trump. And, uh, and so I kind of want to talk about the things that, that he did and why he's doing them. But, uh, you know, so I've been all over the country. In fact, I was in Phoenix this, this morning. I gave a speech and blah, 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 blah. I'm, you know, I have to rush off tonight to go to Florida and so on. So I'm all over the uh, country talking about what Trump does and all sorts of audiences, students, um, <laughs> business groups, uh, you, you know, uh, investor groups and so on. And I always like to ask this question. I want you all to be perfectly honest. You know, you, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want you to be honest. How many of you in this room have a positive opinion of Donald Trump? Raise your hand. Wow, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, how many of you have a negative opinion of Donald Trump? Wow. And how many of you have a positive opinion of Donald Trump but don't want to admit that you have a positive opinion of Donald Trump? Um, so uh, I was giving a talk at, at uh, Silicon Valley um, about a month and a half ago, and I was talking about, I asked the same question about 250 people in the room, and it was similar to this, like six or seven people raised their hand, uh, said they liked Trump, and, you know, I, 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 out of like 250 executives, and I sat down after, you know, I was, after my speech, and there was a lunch afterwards, and uh, like 30 of these executives came up, and they go, I, I really do like Donald Trump. I'm like, you do? Why did you say something? And people kind of feel intimidated to, you know, uh, there's kind of peer pressure or not. I'd, I'd lose clients or, you know, I would be socially ostracized if I said li I like Donald Trump. And one of the reasons, uh, one of my favorite moments on the campaign, and one of the times when I realized, hey, we re actually have a chance of winning this thing, was uh, two weeks before the election. I'm in uh, Tampa, Florida, and I was walking down the street, and I saw this bumper sticker on a car. And sometimes, by the way, in life, a bumper sticker can tell you a lot more about what's going on than any 600-word essay or 600-page tome. And the bumper sticker said this, vote for Donald Trump. Nobody has to know. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's, that, that explained you know, how it is. Why is it the polls had it wrong? Because people lied to the pollsters. Uh, okay, so given the fact that you don't like Donald Trump, I'm not, by the way, my... I am not here to try to persuade you that Donald Trump is a wonderful person or even necessarily agree with his policies, though I think his policies have been quite effective when it comes to the economy. Uh, what I really want to do is kind of explain why Trump is doing the things that he does. Now, one of the things you have to understand about Donald Trump 
is that when it comes to Donald Trump, and I say this as an admirer of his, I do admire him in a lot of ways, but there is a good and a bad and an ugly about Donald Trump, no question about it. Uh, some of his behavior is uh, outrageous, some of the things that he says, I just cringe when he says these things, but what I always tell people is, judge Donald Trump by his results, don't judge him by what he says and does. Judge him by his results. Um, and uh, I think it would be a great thing if he changed some of his behavior. He's like, you know, those old cartoon characters with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And when I say Mary President, please, God, let him listen to the angel and not the devil. So there is a good and a bad and ugly about Donald Trump. Uh, but, uh, but what we really, really were involved in is the economic policy. And so I wanted to kind of walk you through what we did, why we did it, why it is that Trump won. And then I'm really eager to hear your all questions, um, you know, and, and have uh, some really good discussion about this. We had a really fascinating discussion, by the way, at our dinner table about uh, whether states should have the right to secede from the union. So it was just a really fascinating um, discussion. Okay, so the first question is, why were people so angry? Why was there so much economic anxiety in the country um, in 2016? And why did people vote for change? And, um, you know, I used to uh, debate a lot of, uh, you know, Obama and Hillary Clinton's um, economists, and they'd say, you know, gee, why, are, why is everybody so angry? Everything's so good in America today. And yet, you know, we had a, this is what you're measuring, what I'm measuring here is um, the recoveries from recession. As you all remember, in 2008 and 2009, we had a very, very severe recession, one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression, when the housing market collapsed. And that recession ended in June of 2009. And by the way, we've had nine previous recessions since the end of World War II, and the natural course of events is you have a recession and then you have a recovery. And so, you know, what I'm measuring here is how strong is the recovery. And you can see here, here's where the recovery began in June of 2009. By the way, we're almost in June of 2019, right? So this recovery is 10 years old. So it's been a, I'll give Obama credit, this has been a, a very durable and long recovery. In fact, this is maybe one of the longest recoveries we've ever had. The problem is it was pretty flat. It didn't, there wasn't a lot of growth. It was just, it was kind of anemic. And so the economy grew at about 1.8% per year over the seven years, or about 15%. And then, you know, we, we, if you look at the average re recovery, it was significantly bigger. You know, the, the economy grew at about twice the pace that it did in the Obama recovery, and then if you compare that with Reagan, I'm a, I'm a big Reagan guy, and I like to compare Reagan and, and Obama because Reagan, just like Obama, took, took office during an incredible economic crisis during the, during the late 1970s, was one of the worst periods for the U.S. economy ever. We had 20% mortgage interest rates and 15% inflation. The economy was going to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, and, and there were very different philosophies of how you deal with, with a recession. Obama, you know, uh, Reagan cut taxes, cut regulations, um, you know, uh, got control of our money supply and so on. And one sentence, Reagan's very famous line that he ga gave in his uh, famous debate against Jimmy Carter one week before the 1980 election was, government is not the solution, government is the problem. That was sort of the Reagan philosophy. And Obama, in a lot of ways, was, was like, whatever the problem is, there's a government solution. We had Obamacare, we had the $800 billion stimulus plan, we had, you know, tax increases on the rich, we had massive increases in debt and so on. And and, you know, the results are pretty, pretty stark. The economy would be about $3 trillion larger today if we had had more of a Reagan-style recovery than an Obama recovery. And I, and I think people felt this. I think people, you know, when I would go to places like, um, on the campaign, we'd go to places like, um, uh, we'd go to Flint, Michigan, or we'd go to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or we'd go to Charleston, West Virginia, or we'd go to uh, places like Dayton, Ohio, or we'd go to places like Rockford, Illinois. And I remember on the campaign, I'd ask people, how's that Obama recovery going for you to the people living in these places? And they'd, go, they'd laugh at me. They'd go, what recovery are you talking about? There's no recovery here. There were whole areas of the country that didn't really feel the, re the recovery. Yeah, in California, especially places like Hollywood and Silicon Valley, it went boom. Uh, it, you know, New York and Wall Street did great, um, you know, uh, places like that. Washington, D.C. boomed during that period, and yet there were whole areas of the country that were left behind, and, and I think that explains why it is people were voting for change, because they just didn't feel like the country was going in the right direction. Now, the next thing I'm always asked, why is it, um, what is the central tenet of, of Trumponomics? What is it about? What is its driving influence? And I would say it's this, grow. 
grow the economy, that if you get more economic growth and more people working, that all these other problems will be much easier to solve, whether it's income inequality, whether it's the terrible schools in this country, whether it's our bad infrastructure, whether it's poverty in America, the problems in the inner city. The first thing you have to do is grow. And by the way, th that's certainly true of our debt, our national debt. You all know this. I hope you know this because this is a problem your generation is going to confront. We now have a $22 trillion national debt. The debt has been going through the roof. Um, and what you're looking at here is our debt as a share of our GDP. This is the best way to measure our debt burden. And you can see what happened in the last two years of Bush and the eight years of Obama, just a massive increase in government borrowing. And unfortunately, we didn't get a lot for it. And so now we're at about 80% of our GD, our debt is about 80% of our annual GDP. Now, is that a huge crisis that's going to cause a catastrophe? In my opinion, no. No, 80% of GDP, we can live with that. The problem is, and by the way, this is one of the charts we showed Donald Trump when we got involved in working with him, was this is a problem, is these prediction, projections, and these aren't my projections, these are just the official government numbers, they're projecting that over the next 25 years, you know, which is right when you're gonna be in your, the heart of your working age, the debt goes through the roof and it just escalates and escalates and it goes up to 150% of GDP in the next 25 years or so. That's a crisis, right? That's a future we cannot allow to happen. And it, you know, if we're at 150% of GDP, then we look like Detroit or Puerto Rico or Greece or other places that are, have gone bankrupt. And you, what happens is your debt is so high that you're just paying taxes to pay interest on the debt and you don't have any money for anything else, schools or streets or police or m national defense and so on. And so there are two things that are driving this projection of a really um, grim future for the United States. And those two things are, well, let me ask some of the students. What, 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 are, what are the things that are driving these numbers up, 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 up every year? What is it? Entitlements, you know, the entitlement programs. The, the, the fact that what, right now in America, I'm a baby boomer. I, if you were born between the ages of 1948 and 1964, um, you're a boomer. There are 80 million baby boomers. We're retiring at the, at the pace of 10,000 people every day. Did you know that 10,000 Americans are retiring every day? That means 10,000 Americans are moving out of the workforce and paying taxes into collecting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and all these other programs. That puts an enormous stress on the system. So one of the things that's driving this is the aging of the population. And that puts an enormous stress on your generation because we've known this, uh, you know, this, uh, the Titanic has been headed to this iceberg. We've known this for 30 years, right? And politicians never did anything about it. So that's a problem. But the other thing that's driving these really ugly numbers, is, and, you know, we started looking at this, is they're assuming 1.8 to 1.9% growth for the U.S. economy. And our attitude, you know, when we, when we put this plan together for Trump was, hell no, we're not going to grow at 1.8 for 1.9%. We're America. We're going to grow much, much faster than that. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna uh, make it like a, a national mission that the U.S. economy grow to 3 to 4%, and we have to do whatever it takes to, get, to ratchet up our growth rate to uh, get to 3 to 4%. And if you do that, you know, you, you, we could argue about whether that's possible. I, you know, the good news is we've already gotten to 3% growth in Trump's second year in office. But once you get to 3% growth, instead of the debt going up every year, the debt stabilizes and it, it falls. And by the way, the reason for this, you know, this is another great rule in life, is Albert Einstein used to say that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. So the compounding effect of something that grows at 1.8% per year versus something that grows at three and a quarter per year, those lines just go like this over time. And so growth is everything. Uh, you know, we need to have more growth. And by the way, to get more growth, just as an aside, you need more workers. And one of the areas where I think Trump is wrong, um, although I think his opinion is changing a little bit th about this, is to, how, do, how can America get more workers? Immigration, right? This is one, the one demographic safety valve that the United States has over every, virtually every other country because every smart and talented and hardworking person in the world who wants to leave, they don't want to go to Australia, they don't want to go to Canada, they don't go to Germany, they don't want to go to China, they want to come here. So we have this natural benefit that we can import really talented and skilled and hardworking people that want to become Americans and we can smooth out our demographic cycle and we don't have to end up with this. So that, but, but the key is getting the growth rate up and, and that's our central aim. Now, the next thing is this is your quick economic history in three minutes. 
which is what you're looking here is just that the, the, this is just the S&P 500, the stock market over the last 50 years, and the, the blue line is just the S&P 500. It's on a logarithmic scale, and the green line is the S&P uh, 500 um, uh, adjusted for inflation. I'm using the stock market as kind of a proxy for how the economy has done over the last 50 years. And what you can see here, I mean, look at the green line. This is really something that's not well um, understood, but the worst period for the U.S. economy since the Great Depression was the period from about 1969 to 1982. The 70s were the worst period for the U.S. economy, um, and look what happened to the stock market. It fell by 70 percent from 79, from 69 to 82, and then you see this gigantic burst in prosperity. Unbelievable. Like what you're looking at here from 1981-82 to 2000 is arguably the greatest period of prosperity in the history of the world. I get so sick of people saying, oh, the middle class is not as well off today as they were 50 years ago. Like, what are they talking about? I mean, the wealth of the nation grew spectacularly. Wages grew, jobs grew, our national prosperity grew, our assets grew. And, and so, you know, we saw this massive increase and it started under Reagan, but it also accelerated even more so under Bill Clinton, whom Bill Clinton was a very pro-business Democrat. And look at that. I mean, it just went straight up. And then you see what happened. You know, then we had the the stock market burst with the high tech bubble in, in 19, uh, around 99, 2000. And then of course it burst again here. This is the real estate crisis. Now the good news is we've been on a nice steep ascent since around 2009 when we hit the bottom. And, and that's a good thing. People are saying, well, the economy's running out of gas. No, I don't, I don't believe that. We're just, we're here on the cycle. You know, we're only, we, we, in my opinion, we have 10 or 12 years of, of really strong growth ahead of us if we get the policies right. So that's our aim is to keep this thing going. Um, let's skip that one. So the next thing is like, just is there a Trump effect? You know, did, has Trump positively impacted the economy? Because this is an issue of debate. When I do CNN, and I am with fake news, and you know, when I do fake, uh, when I do fake news, you know, they have me on with these economists, and they, they'll say, you know, they're having a hard time. A lot of liberals are having a hard time explaining how it is that this president, who they all said was going to cause the second Great Depression if he was elected, now we're here two years later with the best economy in 20 years, and that, that they're hard, having a hard time squaring that circle that that, that you know Trump has created the, this really great economy. And so, you know, is, it, is there a Trump effect here? Well, I, look, I think there is. I mean, this is, this is what happened literally 24 hours after the election. Look at what happened to small business optimism. We've, not, we've been doing these polls for like 50 years. We've never seen any, like, literally a day after the election, it just went straight through the roof because Trump is a businessman. That's the other thing about Trump. What, you know, Trumponomics is Trump is a businessman. He understands business and that makes a big difference as we're discovering. And small business optimism, by the way, has stayed really, really high ever since. And by the way, small businesses are the spinal corn of the American economy, right? We, one of the things that makes America a unique country is that we're so small business dominant. Um, you know, we have something like um, 28 million small businesses in this country, and they feel good about things. They feel good about the direction that government, uh, Trump is sort of getting government off their back. And then same thing with consumer confidence. It went way up after the election and it stayed high. And then my favorite one is just how do Americans rate the economy today? How do they rate the economy? If you look at, you know, three months before the election, um, back in like, Mar you, know, uh, you know, March of uh, 2016, maybe six months before the election, um, only three out of 10 Americans rated the economy as good or great. You know, that was six years into recovery and only three out of 10 Americans rated the economy as good or great. You know what that number is today? almost uh, over 70%. So there's been a huge sense that the economy is headed in the right direction. The numbers just came out a few weeks ago on this with really strong ratings for how the economy is. People are feeling the prosperity, so that's good. What, what, what are the things that we did to make the economy better? One, is the thing, one of the things we did was try to deregulate the economy. Uh, we want clean air and clean water, and we want safe, you know, we obviously want safe, um, you know, safe spaces and we want, you know, make sure there's not consumer fraud and things like that. But there was a huge increase in regulation under, under Obama and Trump has, has reduced the regulatory burden. And that, you know, when we, when we would meet with the CEOs of major companies, people were major employers in the country, and we asked them, what's your biggest problem in terms of growing your business and hiring more workers? I thought they would say the tax burden, but they didn't. They say the regulatory burden was holding them back and now you've, they kind of feel um, liberated from that, that uh, regulatory burden. So that's a good positive thing. Now on the trade thing, you know, we were talking about this, a couple of people at our table were asking me about Trump and trade because look, I'm a free trade guy. You know, there's four pillars of prosperity, right? 
It's sound money, free trade, less regulation, and lower taxes. Those are the four things you want to get right. And so, uh, you know, Trump is suspect on the first one, right? I mean, he has cut taxes. That's been good. He's reduced regulation. Um, sound money is something the Fed has control over. But trade is something Trump was very unorthodox as a Republican. And by the way, you know, you, I, I, some of my more conservative friends say, oh, how can you support Trump? He's a trade protectionist and so on. Um, Trump won the election in no small part because he went to these Midwestern states where factories were leaving and he said, look, you know, the, the free trade hasn't worked well for you. And if you went to some of these areas, I, you know, they may be right or wrong about why the factories were leaving, but the factories were leaving and people felt left behind in these areas. And so, you know, Trump basically said, I'm going to bring back your job. I'm going to put slap these tariffs on some of these other countries. And, and when we had this argument with Trump about it, you know, I, we said, Donald, you're a, you're a protectionist, he would get very angry at us. And he'd say, I'm not a trade protectionist. He'd say, I believe in free trade. I understand the value of free trade. He'd say, but we need to have a, f a level playing field. And I want to make sure that other countries aren't cheating and that they're not taking advantage of us. And so we started looking at the data and, you know, lo and behold, I think Trump had a point. I mean, it is true. I mean, it's just a factual truth that we have you know, virtually the lowest tariffs of any other country. I think Australia has lower tariffs than us, and I think Hong Kong does. But of our major trading partners, you can see, you know, some of the countries like Canada and the EU are not too much higher than us, but look at a country like South Korea and China. China's tariffs are three times higher than ours are. Um, that's, that's a problem, you know. So Trump said, look, I want these countries to reduce their tariffs so we can sell more, good, more, more goods and services and create more jobs in America. We're all for that. And so this is his complaint. We, you know, if we have free trade agreements with these countries, why are their tariffs higher than ours are? And so uh, now, look, the big issue of our time, I, it, it's the biggest issue that you all are going to have to worry about in your generation it's not climate change. The most important issue that you're going to have to confront is whether the United States of America, this great, great country, continues to be the global superpower or whether it's going to be China. You know, for the last 75 years, the United States has been the unrivaled economic superpower. But now for the first time, we have China. They have ambitions to, to replace the United States as the, as the world economic superpower. I was debating with the, this Chinese professor from Beijing the other day, and I said, you know, there's no way that China's ever going to take over, you know, as the world economic superpower from the United States. And he growled at me. He said, why is that? And I said, because our Chinese are smarter than your Chinese. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the fact is that... Um, we, uh, we have this, this situation where China wants to take over. And we're, look, in my opinion, we are in an abusive relationship with China. And it can't continue. You know, they are cheating. They are stealing. They are lying. They are in, involved in, they steal $300 billion of our technology. We're here in the great state of California. One of the things that you produce is these amazing technologies and amazing patents and things like that. The Chinese just steal that stuff and they don't pay it, us for it. That's theft. They are involved in industrial espionage against the United States. They're hacking into our computer systems. They, have, they make it very, very difficult for American businesses to do business over in China. So we've um, opened up our markets to them. They haven't opened up their markets to us. And we can't go on with that. So I am very much in favor of what Trump is doing with China, which is saying, look, you know, if you want to understand Donald Trump, you have to read his book, right? And what is his book? The Art of the Deal. And whether you like Donald Trump or not, one thing that is impressive about Donald Trump, this guy is an expert negotiator. And as an expert negotiator, one of the things that he's taught me about negotiating is whenever you're negotiating with someone, you want to have leverage over the other person, right? And so Trump understands that when we're negotiating with China, we have leverage over China. We have leverage over them. What is that leverage? As Trump used to say to me all the time, he'd say, Steve, if we can't trade with China, we sneeze. If they can't trade with us, they catch pneumonia. China cannot grow. They are incapable of growing if they don't have access to America's massive consumer market. We're the prize, right? Nobody can replace the United States as the consumer market. That's how China grows, is by exporting all of the stuff to the United States. By the way, we benefit from the fact that they export all this stuff for, you know, you go to Walmart, you get damn near anything you want for 99 cents. It's all made in China. That benefits American consumers. But China can't grow if they can't sell us the stuff. And so Trump is using that leverage to get China to play fair and to stop cheating and stealing. Whether or not he can get this done, I don't know. We've already got a 10% tariff on China, by the way. 
and that's already put the hurt to their economy. It's not being well reported, but their factories, their warehouses, their docks are full of merchandise they can't sell. And if we don't come, come to an agreement with China, I can guarantee you this, Trump is going to hit them with a 25% tariff, and that will do significant damage to them. I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope that we get this trade deal done, because once we get it done, I think the economy is going to grow even faster, but there's no assurance that that's going to happen because the ball is in Beijing's court. Now, I'm not a sycophant. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you everything Donald Trump does is, way, is great. I mean, I think one stupid, this is kind of a nice like, a little economics lesson about why trade tariffs can be very harmful to a country. So what we're looking at here is how many jobs and how many are created and how many jobs are lost from steel tariffs. We have steel and aluminum tariffs right now in the United States, thanks to Trump. I mean, the reason Trump has imposed those steel tariffs is he's trying to save steel jobs. You know, they, the reason you call it protectionism, you're trying to protect people's jobs in those industries. So we're trying to protect our steel industry. Um, and lo and behold, by putting those tariffs in, look, we've created steel jobs. It's not surprising, right? We've made imported steel more expensive, so people are buying more, you know, U.S.-made steel. So that's a good thing. But, you know, and there's a couple of other industries that have benefited from those tariffs. But the problem is, I've told Trump this 15 times, you're, yeah, you're going to save steel jobs, but steel is an input in everything that we produce virtually. Not everything, but ma most manufacturing items. So guess what? If you make steel in the United States more expensive, you, you get it? That makes everything, all these other things more expensive, so you lose jobs in those industries. So these are all the industries, the manufacturing industries, where we're losing jobs. So this is why protectionism is a, is a misguided policy, and I think he was wrong on that. By the way, he's also talking about auto terrorists would also be, I think, a big mistake. So I agree with him on the China stuff, but not on these other things. Now, the, other, the next point is like energy. <laughs> this is like such a huge issue. I mean, we, if you want to understand what's happened in the American economy over the last 10 years, the driving force for what it got us out of the recession of 2008 and 2009, and has been the massive increase in our American production, you can summarize all this in four words, shale, oil, and gas. It has completely changed everything in the world of energy. And the good news is we've invented this stuff like fracking, we've invented you know, horizontal drilling. These drillers now go two miles deep into the ground, two, two miles horizontally. Because of fracking, they can go through the shale rock. It's like overnight we quadrupled the amount of oil and gas we have in the country. And guess what? We have become almost literally the new Saudi Arabia of oil and gas production. It's the most spectacular things you've ever seen. So look at this, our, our oil, just in the last 10 years, look at that. We've almost doubled, more than doubled our oil and gas production. By the way, nobody, remember when I said at the beginning, sometimes experts have it completely wrong. If I had stood in this room 10 years ago and told you we're gonna have the biggest oil and gas boom in the history of this country, you would all said, you know, this guy's been drinking or something. How could somebody, nobody expected this to happen, but because of innovation, it has. So we are now for the first, these, by the way, these are imports from OPEC countries. Look at that, down, down, down. How awesome is that? It used to be we had to import $200 billion a year from oil and gas from Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and Venezuela and countries like that. Now we're actually producing more oil and gas than we're consuming. We're a net exporter of oil and gas. That's one of the most spectacular things that's happened in the economy in a long, long time. Um, one of the repercussions, by the way, energy is the master resource, right? Everything that we have, the meal that you're eating, the table you're sitting at, the computer that you're tapping on, the car that you're gonna drive, everything is derivative of energy, right? You have to have energy to produce things. And so, you know, look at what's happened to the price of energy in this country. It's, it's unbelievable. So this is like a massive tax cut for American companies and American consumers. It's like the gift that just keeps on giving and it's, it's, it's just awesome. That, and by the way, we're not running out of this stuff, right? The great news is we have 250 years of natural gas, we have 200 years of oil, with existing technologies, um, it's it's a it's an incredible thing. Um, the you know I just thought I'd show you this. You know, look, renewable energy. I know everybody's really into that. It's still pretty much a fringe. Maybe you know, 50 or 100 years from now, we'll have the, or maybe even 20, 30, 40 years from now, we might have the technology to make you know wind and solar power. Well, look, wind is a stupid way to get energy, but solar power actually is a is a you know could have a you know if we get it right, solar energy could be a very competitive thing with oil and gas. But right now, it's not. But today, we only get you know something like you know, less than 10% of our energy comes from wind and solar. So, you know, if we're going to continue to be a $22 trillion industrial economy, we're going to have to use our resources. And I just thought I'd show you this because I think it's interesting. You know, our area, you know, one of the areas where 
This is so great. Look at what's happened just the last 40 years. Even as we produce more and more and more things, look at what's happened to air quality in the United States. I mean, it's just amazing. So, you know, I, I ask a lot of college kids. I mean, I think you all know this because you're smart, but I, sometimes I'll go to Princeton or Yale. I'll go, do you think the, that the air was cleaner today or 50 years ago? And these kids, like 80% of the kids, oh, 50 years ago was cleaner. It's like, well, are you crazy? I mean, we, today we have the cleanest air we've ever, I mean, imagine what you know, cities like Los Angeles and Pittsburgh and others were like, you know, uh, 50 years ago versus today. So we're clean, we can, the point of this is, you know, you can be rich and you can have a clean environment at the same time. So that's a nice thing to, by the way, you know, the richer you get, the cleaner your environment is. So that's a good thing. And then, you know, some of you are concerned like, about climate change and so on, and you may think this is the greatest threat. Uh, but I'll tell you this, if, if combating climate change is not gonna, it's not gonna happen through the Paris Climate Accord. Because here's the Paris Climate Accord, here's what the countries, how, how they're meeting their targets after three years. None of, half of the countries ever meet, met 50% of their, you know, their, um, you know, their um, targets. By the way, here's an amazing question for you. I'll bet this will surprise uh, uh, you, uh, many of you. Um, what country do you think has reduced its car, uh, all the industrialized countries in the world? Which country do you think has reduced its uh, carbon emissions the most? Anybody know? United States of America. How many of you knew that, by the way? Raise your hand, like five of you did. You can be excused not for knowing that because how would you know it? Nobody in the media ever talks. Wait, the United States, we've reduced our carbon emissions more than France, more than Germany, more than the sanctimonious Asians, you know, China, India, Mexico. How did that happen? How are we reducing our carbon emissions? We're not part of the stupid Paris Climate Accord. We're not part of the, you know, we never signed on to the Kyoto Treaty. We don't have a cap and trade system. We don't have carbon taxes, and yet we've reduced our carbon emissions more than any other country. Now, here's the question for you. How? How did that happen? How is it that we're reducing our carbon emissions? It's a two-word answer. Anybody know? Natural gas. Natural gas. It turns out natural gas is the wonder fuel of the future. It's cheap. It's abundant. It's reliable. It's made in America, and it's clean burning. It's everything that you want in a fuel. And I, never, I can't understand this logic of like getting rid of natural gas. It's, it's making our environment cleaner, not less clean. Um, you know, I was just going to show you this maybe, and then since you said I've only got five minutes or so, uh, I, I just, it, it, it really concerns me that I see these polls now that half of recent college graduates now say that they believe socialism is superior to, uh, you know, free market capitalism. I'm, I don't know, I'm not going to even do a poll in this room, but, you know, your generation, especially the millennials, they, they've, they believe that. And, you know, I, I'm, we were talking, you know, I was lucky enough to have known Milton Friedman. I, I spent a lot of time with Milton. I was friends with him. You know, he's the great, in my opinion, the greatest economist of the 20th century. And, you know, Milton, I, at the end of his life, I used to talk to him a lot about what was going on in the world because it was near the 20th, end of the 20th century. And he, he would say to me, Steve, what do you think is the enduring lesson of the last 100 years in America and around the world? And, you know, it's, it should be obvious to everyone the lesson of the 20th century. Right? It is that socialism, communism, Maoism, Stalinism, Bernie Sandersism, whatever you want to call this stuff that has more government power, that those models are a complete failure. And not only are they failure, they've led to the, you know, they've led to some of the great a greatest acts of genocide. I mean, Mao killed 200 million of his own people and so on. That those, those are a failure, and yet, and, and by the way, the other lesson is that free market capitalism is a success, right? I mean, we just have the evidence around the world. The countries that move towards free market capitalism are rich, and the countries that don't have free market capitalism are politically repressed and poor. And one of the ways I like to um, kind of summarize this, and I'll stop with this, is this is, you know, in, as economists, we have a tough time holding everything constantly. Why is it that, you know, let's say, United States is, is richer than Mexico? And there might be a hundred reasons why the United States is richer than Mexico. So it's hard to point, pinpoint any one thing that explains why the United States is, is richer than one country or another. But in this case, this is just, how many of you have seen this book before? This is just a satellite photograph of Korea at night. It's not even, re this was taken 15 years ago, so it's not even that recent. But this is satellite photo of Korea at night. This is the Korean Peninsula. You all know your history that, um, you know, if 60 or so years ago, they drew an artificial line, you know, in the sand 
on this peninsula, and half of the peninsula became free market oriented, and North Korea became communist, socialist, whatever you want to call it. And by the way, these white, th this right here, that's Seoul, South Korea. That's an amazing city. It's like three times the, the size of Chicago. I just got back from there about six months ago. It's burgeoning with activity. The people are happy. They're rich. They're prosperous. Uh, you know, they're entrepreneurial. And, you know, you see that Seoul. Look at that. Look at North Korea. That one little splotch, that's like Kim Il Jung's castle. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, today, now here's the thing. It's the perfect natural experiment, right? It's the perfect natural experiment because the P North Koreans and South Koreans are the same in every single way. Right? They have the same history, they have the same language, they have the same geography, they have the same DNA, they have the same you know, culture. Everything is the same about them, except they drew this line in the sand, and all of a sudden, the average, you know, after 60 years, it shows how much you can screw up a place. In just 60 years, the average South Korean today has an income that's four times higher than the average North Korean. Now, how can anybody deduce from this that they want to be more like North Korea. Now people, when I show this to some students, they go, oh, no, 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 when we mean socialism, we mean the good kind of socialism. Where? Where's the good kind of socialism? It's like saying, I mean, I want the, you know, the good kind of a venereal disease. There isn't one, right? You know, so there is no good social. Even like, you know, Sweden or, you know, or, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, some of these Nor Nor uh, Norwegian countries, they are, um, they are moving away from socialism because it's not working for them. Sweden is very aggressively moving away from it. So I don't understand this fascination with, with, um, with uh, socialism. Um, and the final thing I'll show you, and then I'll just stop, I just thought this would be an interesting one for discussion. That we were having this discussion about the states and where is the economy growing and where is it not growing? And, you know, this is the other experiment that I like because I think it shows the power of like lower taxes, less regulation, so on. This is where people are moving to and where people are moving from. One of the great things about America is we're a just gigantic 50 state free trade zone, right? You can move anywhere you want in this country. You don't need a passport. You don't have to show your passport at the border when you go from California to Oregon or something like that. And so people can move wherever they want to. And what's happened in spades over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years is that people, especially more so now than ever before, people are moving from blue states to red states. It just is a, is a fact of the matter that it's happening. And it's embarrassing to people from blue states because they're losing their most important resources, which is their people. You know, your people are your most important resources. And so every day in America, 1,000 people are moving from blue states to red states. You know, now, by the way, these numbers don't, these are just um, domestic these are Americans, they're not, I'm not counting immigration, because you have actually immigrants that, a lot of immigrants who come in the United States, I mean, into Canada, I'm just talking about where are Americans moving to and from, and where are the moving vans picking up people and moving them in and out of. And so what you're seeing here is, look at, the, by the way, the four largest states in the United States are California, Texas, New York, and, and Florida. Uh, one out of three Americans lives in those four states, and as this is another nice natural experiment because two of those states are red states and two of them are blue states. So look at, look at Texas. 1.4 million people in the last 10 years have moved to Texas. By the way, every time I go to Texas, I was just in Austin last week, you know what I see a lot of? I see a lot of California license plates in, in, in Texas. People are moving to Texas. That's three, by the way, that's three new congressional seats that Texas will have. Florida, I just updated these numbers. So this goes through 2016. The 2018 numbers came out. Florida gained a million people in the last decade. So people are moving to Florida. By the way, anybody know what the income tax rate is in, in, uh, in Florida and Texas? Zero. There's no income tax here. Now, look at California and New York. Look at that. I mean, that's pathetic. New York, 1.3 million people have left. 1.3 million, that's a lot of people moving out. California, I mean, my God, for, I think this is the first time this has ever happened in the history of this great, great state. I mean, this is an unbelievably great state. You have the, some of the greatest universities, you have some of the greatest research facilities, you have the greatest weather, greatest mountains, beautiful uh, you know, seashores, beautiful women. I mean, what's not to like about California? And yet, uh, over the last decade, 900,000 people have moved out of California. You're losing your people. It's really a tragedy. And, and that, you know, the, what accounts for that? You know, why, why is it people, if, if these economies are so great, if this model is so good, why are people moving out of them? And I think it's because people don't want to live in places where there's not a lot of opportunity. I just thought you might be interested in this. These are the states we rate with the best 
uh, you know, economic climate. So Utah is number one, Idaho, Indiana, North Dakota, Arizona, Florida. These are the states that have the best economic outlook. And I just hate to show you this. I mean, I don't, I don't show you this with any joy. I mean, I think it's pathetic, actually. But, you know, these states like New Jersey, California, my home state of Illinois, New York, Connecticut are in bad shape. They're just bleeding people. And so, you know, th that has to change. I mean, the way I put it is the, the politicians in these states like New York and California, Illinois and New York, when it comes to economics, they just don't have their trade tables in the upright and locked position. <laughs> you know, they just don't understand good economics. And so that is uh, an interesting thing. And I think I'll just stop there um, and, and, um, and, and I'm just going to stop there because this is some of those stuff on the tax cut. But the point is the economy is as strong as it's been in 50 years, and at least the labor force is. The good piece of information I have to leave you with tonight is right now in America, for the first time in the history of this country, there are 7.1 million more jobs than people to fill them. Let me say that again. There's seven million more jobs out there for people like you to fill than people to fill them. That's like the equivalent of the entire population of Indiana. So the great news for you is when, for those, how many of you are juniors and seniors in this room? You're, you're entering the labor force with the single best job opportunities in 50 years, since the Beatles were still playing together. So that's how much, you know, what a great opportunity you all have. So you should be very, very thankful to be in this great country of America. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'm very eager to hear um, whatever, whatever comments or criticisms you have. So thank you so much. Thanks for the nice um, applause. Yeah. We now have time for questions. Can I get some um, water? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, we now have time for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. One of us will bring the mic to you. Please stand up if you're able when you ask your question. And feel free to challenge the speaker, but we ask that you do so respectfully. Uh, Mr. Moore, thank you for coming to thank speak you. with us. I yeah, think it's a pleasure really to be here. appreciated really. your talk. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that we could hit the projected growth 3% and, and really do a damage to the debt, the debt that we have if we got the right economic policies. What do you think the right economic policies are uh, in regards to, say, taxes or business regulations, sure. et cetera? Yeah. And that, that would let us hit the growth that we need to get rid of the, the debt yeah. that we have. So we need to do That's a great question. Thank you. I mean, I, that's, a, that's a, a fat one right over the center of the plate. Um, so, you know, look, you know, obviously I talked about regulation. You have to we reduce regulation, which is very good for business. I mean, talk to, I talk to small businessmen and women all the time you know the last chapter of my book is called a light switch is flicked from off to on and that came from a auto mechanic that I met outside of Cleveland Ohio and I talked to him about four months after the November uh, 2016 election I said hey Jimmy you know how's business because he has like 18 me auto mechanics and he got six clerks and he and I, he said that he said this to me Steve it's like the day after the election, a light switch was flicked from off to on, and ever since then, I've had more um, you know, customers than I can handle. And I get that kind of response all of the time. So you know, it's this kind of new environment that you just have, I mean, putting America first is not racist, it's not, it's just basically saying every decision we make in Washington is going to be, does this benefit American workers and American businesses? I mean, What's wrong with that? I mean, every president should do that, right? We should always put America's interests first. That's what a president should do, as Trump says, the French president should put France first and so on. And so um, one of the things, in addition, I'll just kind of show you this, is that we did was we did the tax cut. Now, you know, there's this, oh, it's a big tax cut for rich people, blah, blah, blah. Um, by the way, rich people in California didn't even get a tax cut because, you know, they didn't, they lose their state and local tax deduction. But this is the, the you know, this is a quick lesson in supply side economics. This is the American tax rate on our businesses for the last 30 years, okay? That starts in 1990 through 2016. And we were 40%, and that's a pretty high tax on businesses. And it used to be back in the early 90s, the rest of the, see this pillar is like the average tax rate of all the countries that we compete with. It's Germany and Spain and Italy and Ireland and China and Mexico and so on. And so the average tax rate of all those countries back in the 1980s was actually higher than ours was. So we didn't have a competitiveness problem because our tax rate was high, but the other countries was even higher. So we weren't losing competitive position. What happened over the, the next 25, 30 years is other countries started engaging in Reaganomics. They started realizing, hey, if we cut our tax rates, we make our businesses more competitive, we can, make, we can bring companies over here to the United States, I mean, to our countries, and so down, 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 right? And so, so much so that by the year 2016, we were at 40% and these other countries were at 
And, you know, as, as I told Trump, you know, I said, Donald, this is like a 20% head start program where other country, every country will compete. Look, you don't have to be, you buy into the supply side economics. It's very simple. You know, we're in a competitive world. This is a global economy, folks. There's no putting the genie back in that bottle. You're going to be competing against Chinese workers and Indian workers and Argentinian workers and so on and so forth. We want to make America the best place for businesses to locate. And incidentally, do you think that these countries were reducing their tax rates because they love their companies? You think that's why they did this? Of course not. The reason that they cut their tax rates is they were stealing jobs and factories from the United States. We were easy picking. We're way up here. They could come into these American companies and say, look, they charge you 40%. We'll charge you only 20 Okay, we're out of here. They'd pack their bags and leave. And they'd leave Pennsylvania, and they'd leave Ohio, and they'd leave Michigan. Now, I'm not saying tax is the only thing that matter, but taxes do matter. They do have an impact. That's why like, when I hear AOC say, let's go to a 70% tax rate. I'm, really? I mean, how many jobs do you want to destroy with a 70% tax rate? And so anyway, we, we got this down now to like 21% and then 5%, and that, that makes a hell of a difference. It makes America, we're back in the game again. Now, instead of factories leaving Michigan and going to Mexico, they're coming from Mexico back to Michigan. That's good. That's putting America first. So that would be another policy that we put in place that was really important. The promotion of American energy policy, all of those things have been uh, very conducive to growth. What else? <coughs> Sorry, I should add that priority goes to students. So, hi. Hi, thank you for your talk. Sure. Um, so I just had a question. You had this chart where you basically had the gains to the S&P 500, um, and you kind of used that as um, a proxy for gains yes. in American prosperity. It's not perfect, but it's okay. Yeah, so I guess my concern was about kind of the distribution of those gains to prosperity. Yeah. So yep. empirically, um, since like the Reagan age, labor share of productivity has kind of started to yep. stagnate. Um, wages for people without a bachelor's degree has started to stagnate. And then furthermore, we know the marginal propensity to consume of people on the lower end of the income spectrum is higher, so therefore they not, might not be investing. So insofar as they're not necessarily seeing those gains, and you kind of note this when you say you're going around the campaign trail, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of yeah, these yeah, people yeah. aren't seeing the recovery, yep. should we not care about the distribution of growth, especially sure. given its ability to destabilize yeah. the political system and result in things like the election of Donald Trump? Yeah. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. So a couple of things. I mean, I want you all to put your thinking hats on for a second. Um, so think about, let's start, think about like two, a country, two country world. Let's say it's United States and Mexico. Let's just keep things really simple. So one question I always ask my economic students is, why is it that in the United States, the average wage, you know, by the way, the re wages are not a good way to measure how w workers are doing because they have much more benefits today. We've overstated inflation. I mean, it's just not true that the average worker hasn't made gains. They've made gigantic gains in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, it's unquestionable. The things that people have today versus what they had 40 years ago, it's, it's not even equi equivalent. I would say the average American, even if you adjust for all these things like benefits, health benefits, retirement benefits, all these things, the average worker has probably got a, a living standard that's about 40 to 50 percent higher than a family that grew up in, uh, like, let's say, the 1960s. So there have been, there've been giant gains for the middle class, but we want, but I see your point, because you do have people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Charles, you know, like, you know, uh, LeBron James that are making, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Now, one question I would ask you is, okay, how do we help the average worker in America get a higher wage. In other words, so in the average, today in the United States, the average wage for the average American worker is about $28 an hour. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty high wage, $28. The average wage in Mexico is about $9 an hour. So that means that the average American, just stop talking about the average American worker, gets three times more than the average Mexican worker. Now, why is that? How is it that an American business can, can, tr can pay an American worker, $28 an hour, whereas in Mexico, the average worker gets only $9 an hour. What accounts for that difference? The what? Cost of living no, in Mexico? not cost of living. I mean, the cost of living is a little bit lower, but that's, that's not, wh wh how, are, how is it the wages have gone up so much in, in uh, the United States? I mean, this is a fundamental economic issue. What leads to higher wages? Who said that? Productivity, of course. 
Of course. The reason, one reason that the average American worker can get three times as much as the average Mexican worker is because the average American produces three times more than the average Mexican worker in an hour. So they, the, the company can pay them three times more. Now, then that's almost like a tautology, though, because productivity is wages. Why is the average American worker more productive? What makes a worker more productive? What? Maybe capital intensity of the, of the industries in which they're working? I'm sorry, the what? Like the capital intensity of the industries Cap in which they're yes, working? Yes, absolutely. Capital investment. So what is capital investment? It's computers. It's technology. It's a forklift. It's, you know, um, it's things that make Americans more productive. Um, it, it's technology, right? So we have, one of the reasons we're developing all these incredible technologies is that people, you know, when I was in my, uh, you know, when I was uh, four, you know, like 12 years old, my parents took me to a, to a uh, auto, to Detroit, where we went into one of the car factories. And it was like a sweatshop. You know, it was like a Dickens sweatshop. People were in hot, grimy, they were carrying around these big steel beams. It was horrible. You know, you go into an auto factory today, it's completely different. I mean, we, you know, people are dealing with diagnostic equipment and they're dealing with computers and they're tapping. They're not carrying around stuff because they have technology, they have capital, and the more capital you have, the more productive you are and the higher your wages are. Why did we cut the corporate, people say, why did you cut the business tax rate? Because we want businesses to invest more money here. And when they invest more money here, who are the people who benefit from that? The American worker. You can't have higher wages unless you have more capital investment. And of course, what's the other way that a, a worker is more um, productive? It's why you're at this school, right? Education, right? Education, skills, training. The average American has a lot more education and skills and training than the average Mexican does. You know, the, you, you all are at this great university. You're developing your what we call the human capital that makes you more valuable to employers. So we have to increase to get wages up. We have to do two things. We have to increase capital investment by businesses, right? And we have to improve the education system in America. I think personally, I think that the our education system today is a total disgrace. You know, it's, it's, I can't believe we tolerate, you know, what happens in inner city schools today. It's a disgrace, and every one of us should rise up and protest about what's happening. I, look, I grew up in Chicago. I've been to the Chicago public schools. They are, nobody can learn in those schools. I've been, to, I live in Washington, D.C. right now. It is awful, awful. None of you as parents, when you become parents, would ever want to send your kids to these schools. So we have to do something about improving our education system um, as well, and that will lead to you know, better gains. Now, I want to make one other quick point. This is another life lesson for you. This is maybe one of the most important things I can tell you. So hopefully you all want to, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting rich, right? <laughs> what we want to do in America is make everybody rich, right? You know, we want, it's one of the things I have problems with with this income inequality issue is let's not get confused. We don't want to make rich people poor, right? We want to make poor people rich, right? We want to make poor people rich, not rich people poor. Um, so we don't want to tear down the rich. We want to build up the poor. And so one of the ways you can do that, by the way, is it gets to your point that one of the tragedies is we had the biggest stock market boom in the history of the world, and only half of Americans were invested in the stock market. Why don't we have a system that gets every American in the stock market? And there's a very good way to do this, and we need your generation to get behind this issue right now. And that is when you start working, the day you start working full time, uh, I know many of you, you know, work part time or you know, maybe took a year off, but when you start you know, working full time in your career, you're gonna start paying um, a tax of about 10% of every paycheck that you earn. Every paycheck you earn, 10% is gonna be taken out for social security. It is the single worst investment that you will ever make in your life, is social security. You're going to be put. Think about think about the alternative. What if we had a system where instead of you having to take having the government take 10% of your money away from you and spend it on all these other things? What if we had a system where each of you could set up a private retirement account, <laughs> where you just put that money into a private account and you could build up your assets over time? And you know what would happen if you did that? If you just had an average wage for the next 40 years of your lifetime, you would have well over a million dollars in that account. Everyone in this room would have a benefit that would be two to three times more than you're gonna get from Social Security. And that assumes that Social Security is even gonna be there. I mean, how many of you think Social Security is gonna be there 40 years from now? I mean, not many, right? I mean, the system is so bankrupt. 
You need to rise up and protest and demand that you have control of your own money. I grew up in the 60s generation when the, you know, there was famous you know, Vietnam protests when the, when the students all marched on Washington. Remember when they said, you know, in protest of Vietnam, hell no, we won't go. What I, we, need, we need hundreds of thousands of your generation to march on Washington. And, you know, and by the way, back then what they did was they burned their draft cards you know, in protest of the Vietnam War. We need you all to come to Washington, get hundreds of thousands of students come and burn your social security cards and say, hell no, we won't pay. You know, hey, hey, we won't pay or something. I mean, because this is a ripoff. And think about the, how, what the impact that would have on income inequality if you could get every single America owning a piece of the rock. Now, I'm gonna tell you a story. You're not gonna believe this, but it is true. You can look it up. And it gets to my point I made earlier. So there's a very famous story of an African-American named Theodore Johnson. I read about him in the Chicago Tribune about 15 years ago. Theodore Johnson was an uh, African-American. He, he served in World War II. He was a flight, fighter pilot. He came back from World War II, and he, uh, he worked as a UPS truck driver his entire life from 1948 to the year he retired, I think, was around 1980. So his whole life, he drove a, one of the brown UPS trucks. And his highest salary that he ever earned t throughout his whole life was $48,000 a year. That was his top salary when he retired, $48,000 a year. But Theodore Johnson did something really interesting that I would recommend to everybody in this room do this. What Theodore Johnson did is every paycheck he got from the time he was 22 years old to the time he retired, he took 15% of that paycheck and he bought UPS stock with it. And that was a sacrifice. He had to take, you know, instead of having 100% of his salary to spend, he only had 85% and the other 15% he saved. And he just did it, you know, meticulously every single paycheck, two, twice every month for 35 years. And so here's the most amazing thing. So the reason I know about Theodore Johnson, there was a big article on the front page of the Chicago Tribune about him. He died in the year something like, um, you know, uh, he died in like 2003. And his, uh, the story was about his estate. And here's a guy who never earned more than $46,000 a year. His, when he died, his kids opened up his estate. And they were shocked to find that Theodore Johnson who never made more than $46,000 a year, left an estate to his kids of $47 million. $47 million. What is the point of that, that story? I said it before, I'll say it again. Compound interest is the most powerful for, if you start investing at a young age, the, pro the problem you identify is exactly right. We need to get every single American to own stock. That's how you get rich. Invest at an early age, that way you can have uh, a lot of money. So we need to get, don't you think it would be great if every single American owned stock so that when the uh, whole, it's like owning a piece of the rock. If the economy does better, everybody does better. Right now we have a system where if the economy does better and businesses do better, only half of the workers do. But even that's an exaggeration, by the way, because the vast majority of Americans have pension funds, you know, the union funds are all invested in the stock market. So when the stock market does better, the country does. Any, any, any more um, questions before we have to break this off? Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't see you over there. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'd first like to just point a, a quick thing out. You were complaining about a 10% social security tax rate. It's actually 6.2% and I don't think you should be misleading people about how much money is no, coming out of the No, it's because remember the other paycheck. half comes out of the employer. So what I'm saying, but, but, the ten, so but they aren't seeing 10% out of no, 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 their no, so, paycheck. No, 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 let's so be very clear about this. So the way the system works is out of your paycheck, 6% is taken out of your paycheck and the employer takes 6% they would have otherwise paid you and they put it in. And so but, it's actually a fiction. But that's not coming out of your salary. So that, what? That's not coming sure out does. of your salary. Sure it does. It's because it's direct cost of hiring an employee. There's, I mean, look, the economists are very clear on this. It adds to the cost of hiring a worker just like a health benefit does. So you could either pay the, the worker a, a, you know, a salary or you can provide them a salary. That, that wasn't my question though. I just okay. wanted to. But it's just untrue what you said. Okay. Because that temper, every single worker could have 10%. And by the way, even if it were true, under the plan I'm talking about, you would just have the employer put 5% into that account and you'd have the employee put it. So it's the, still the same 10%, whether it's play, put in by the employer or the my, my question was different though. You've been talking a bit about 
uh, the tax bill, you sort of touched on it a little bit. I, it seemed like you were going to uh, go into it more if you had more time in your talk. And so I was sort of confused because you had also been talking about how we had to reduce the national debt, mm -hmm. and yet the tax bill, according to the CBO and most unbiased estimates, mm -hmm. would increase the national debt by about $3 trillion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious how you square those two things and why, right. you would, why you would advocate for both reducing the national debt and yet increasing it on the backs of okay. the middle class through question. the tax bill. So like the, the, what the uh, Congressional Budget Office did is they estimated that when you take into the growth uh, effect, the growth effects, because you're going to have faster growing economy with lower tax rates, and they estimated about $1.6 trillion over 10 years. Now here's what's interesting. So wh we've already ratcheted up the growth rate, you know, as I described earlier, from like 1.9 to 3. So that's a big increase. And so the Congressional Budget Office just came out with numbers a couple of months ago. I wrote a big Wall Street Journal editorial about this, that um, what the CBO has done from the time, from the, their last estimate before we passed our tax cut. So what would the world look like if we didn't pass the tax cut w versus what their la latest estimate is about how big the economy will be over the next 10 years? Now this will, this is a pretty amazing number because it's only been, we're only one, we're only about a little over a year into the tax cut, right? Because it passed in 2017, so it affected people in 2018 and the first part of 2019. The CBO has already increased their estimate of the GDP over the next 10 years by $6 trillion. $6 trillion. So the federal government gets what? Let's just, they get about 18% of GDP. So what's 18% of GDP? Let's say it's 20%, let's just round up. So 20% of $6 trillion is $1.5 trillion. The, the tax cut is almost already paid for itself because of the higher growth rate. And that's, the, remember I, sh I showed you the numbers about if you have the higher growth rate, the debt goes down as a share of GDP, it doesn't go up. Now, will the, I'm not saying that, that the tax cut is gonna pay for itself. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, would you like to have a booming economy, because we have a booming economy right now, with a little bit higher debt, or many more people unemployed and less jobs and so on with a lower debt. I'm not, look, here's my point. <clears throat> I'm not against debt per se. You know, debt is not um, evil, right? Or else nobody would own a home, right? How do people get homes? They borrow. So what matters is what you borrow for, right? If you borrow for something that's productive, then it's worth doing. If you borrow for something that's not productive, it's not worth doing. My problem with the $800 billion that Obama borrowed was that they borrowed for things that had no payoff, right? We had like Solyndra, we had, you know, they gave out food stamps and disability payments and welfare. I mean, welfare doesn't increase the economy, right? I mean, it, it may be a, you know, it may be a thing you want to do for justice reasons, but it's not going to make the country richer to give people money for not working. What we did was actually paying people for working and increase their take-home pay and so on. So I'm really proud of it. I think the, the results have been phenomenal so far. I mean, this, the recovery didn't happen by accident. I mean, this boom that we're seeing right now, I think was in no small part a result of the tax cut. But look, we'll see. You know, there's no right answer right now. We'll, we'll have to see what happens over the next few years. But I would say so far, you got to admit, so far, so good, because this economy is really, really strong. We yeah. still have 10 oh. minutes. Oh, I didn't see you back there, sorry. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. I had a question about one of your earlier visuals where you're comparing the Obama recovery to the Reagan recovery yeah. and the average uh, recession yeah. recovery. So it seems like here you're kind of comparing apples and oranges, that many of those previous recessions were caused by controlled Fed rate raises. Controlled they were con caused by what? Uh, federal interest rate raises that led to uh -huh. subsequent recessions yep. and were therefore right. very controlled. Even something like the dot-com bubble that was popped and had real I mean, mm -hmm. asset damage and people were losing money, that was primarily concentrated to people who held interest in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. How do you then compare the recovery from those kinds of recessions to what we saw in the global financial crisis and what is then the Obama recovery where you have widespread asset destruction where people are yeah. losing their houses and losing sure. their primary storage of wealth. Why would you not anticipate a very different type of recovery yeah, in that's a fair point. Look, scenarios? I, it's a very fair point. I mean, look, every recovery, sir, you're exactly right. Every recovery, every recession has a different cause. And, you know, you're going to have different, uh, you know, different velocities of coming out of them. Um, usually, when you have a really, really deep recession, like we had in 2008 and 9. You, once you come out of it, you come out of it really steeply, right? Because you make up for the lost ground, right? Interest rate changes. The, the drawstring mentality has largely been disproven by the global financial crisis. And that's not just the United States, that's worldwide. 
Wait, I, I'm sorry, I am having a little trouble hearing you. The, the idea that the, the harder you pull back on the bowstring in the recession, the faster the recovery when yeah. it snaps back. Yeah. I mean, wasn't that largely disproven by the global reaction to the financial crisis, not just the way the U.S. economy reacted? Well, except that all the countries, look, everything we did in response to the recession was a disaster, right? I mean, and it started under Bush. I mean, first of all, we should never, ever, ever, ever the United States government bail out companies, right? I mean, we spent bill trillions of dollars bailing out companies that made wrong decisions. I mean, we should have let the institutions fail. I mean, there's something called a moral hazard, right? I mean, unless you do, do you all think that the government should be bailing out big companies and banks? I sure don't. I don't want the government giving our money to, to big banks and so on. I mean, look, these companies made really bad decisions, and you don't make an economy better by taking money from the good institutions and giving it to the bad institutions. And that's what we did in the, and by the way, that wasn't Obama, that was Bush. And then Obama provided the big bailouts for the auto companies and so on and so forth. And then we had this massive debt bomb that didn't do anything. It's just, I don't have a problem with thinking big to deal with a big recession like that. It's just that I didn't think that anything that, that Obama did really helped very much, you know, in terms of dealing with the recession. Um, look, we should never fall for the fallacy. You know, I am a big Milton Friedman fan. And Milton Friedman said many, many famous things in his life. But all economics, especially when it comes to public policy, comes down to this one insight. And just never forget this one. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, right? If the government takes a dollar from Apple and it gives it to Citibank, have you created any wealth there? No, all you've done is shifted a resource from Apple that they earned and give it to a, you know, a company that didn't. It's just like saying, does it benefit the economy if, if, the, if I, you know, if I, the government takes $20 from me, what's your name, sir? Zio. So the government takes $20 from me and gives it to Zio. Did we just stimulate the economy? I mean, really, I mean, how stupid is this? How, how does that stimulate the economy? Zio's $20 richer, I'm $20 poorer. How does that stimulate anything? I mean, and by the way, th this is even worse. This isn't even a zero-sum game. It's a negative-sum game because I earned the money and he stole it from me, right? How does, that, how does that benefit the economy? There is no increase to the economy by redistributing income. Now, again, you may redistribute income because you want to do it for social justice reasons, but you're not going to make the economy better. It's, it's like very simple. If you tax something, you get less of it. Right? Do we all agree if you tax something, you get less of it? And if you tax something less, you get more of it. Why did we cut taxes on workers and businesses? Because we want more of them. You know, an AOC is running around the country. Let's say, let's have the 70%. What are you going to get? You're going to get less workers and you're going to get less businesses. I mean, right? I mean, this stuff isn't that complicated. So th that, um, I want my 20 hours back. You know, that doesn't <laughs> stimulate the economy. And that's what we did in the Obama recovery. You've got to create incentives. One more question, then I gotta, I'm running out of gas. Or maybe two more oh. if you want to. Sure. So I think one viewpoint that I think you and I both have in common is that um, we believe in the power of public primary education and also in the ability for people to be able to invest their excess right. money into the stock market. However, I think where you and I differ is that I see taxation and wealth redistribution as the primary ways in which we support primary education, in which we give people of low income the tools necessary to be able to have that excess income to mm -hmm. invest into the stock market, right? And so I'm a little confused how we can hold those two views at the same time, right? Both how we can have um, decreased government spending, decreased taxation, and then also still have this notion of having really strong uh, public education and also still expect low-income people to be able to invest <coughs> money into the stock market when we already know that their wages are going down, not to mention that poverty is linked with far more than just low education, but decreased lifespan, decreased mm -hmm. health span, um, and a host of other things like increased yeah. cortisol and whatnot. So uh, how can we hold those two things uh, simultaneously? I'm, I'm not entirely sure I exactly understand the question. Look, you talked a lot about education. So I, I, I think education is incredibly important. Right? So, so trying to be more condensed, how can we simultaneously say that we should increase the strength of these public institutions yes. while decreasing wait, the wait, 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 hold that on. goes into What that? public institutions do you talking uh, about? Particularly education and then okay. as a secondary, investing in the stock market with excess income. Okay, so let me address the first part of that, okay? Look, um, I'm going to show you a chart because I think it's, it's really illustrative of what's going on in the American economy. So look at this. Um, 
Where is that? Whoops. Uh oh. Sorry. I made a big mistake. So let, let me find this, though, because this is really important. I don't know how I went sailing past what I wanted to. Um, um, these are the some of the Trump numbers. Okay, here it is. Whoops, here it is. Okay. So this is, you know, you talk about education. I think everybody in this room, I think we all agree education is really, really, really important, right? It's one of them our most important. I'd even make the case education is one of our most important industries. What'd you do? Oh, <laughs> all right, now, okay, now I gotta get back to, sorry. Um, so I think we all agree that education is incredibly important. You know, we can't have a thriving and prosperous economy unless we have well-educated Americans, obviously. So um, look at this, because I think it'll blow you away. So here's, um, so you know, when we do the consumer price index, you know, the consumer price index inflation is like a thousand different products that they're looking at, because you know, we have thousands and thousands of products, and it's looking at hundreds and hundreds of industries. And then we take the we conglomerate those and we put them all into one statistic and say, you know, the inflation rate went up by 2.5% or whatever it might be. But what's interesting is you can go to that data and you can find out what the inflation rate is for every single industry, right? You can look, you know, at uh, toys, apparel, clothing, you know, cars, blah, 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 energy, et cetera. And so what's interesting about this is the inflation rate of every, you know, major industry over the last 20 years. And it is so amazing because Look at this, cars, toys, apparel, furniture, computers, software, they've actually been falling in price. That's a good thing, right? It means that these things are cheaper over time. So, you know, you can buy a car today is cheaper than it was 20 years ago and it's incredibly better, right? And that doesn't even account for the productivity improvement. I got it, look, I'll show you this. My kids get a big kick out of this. This is my cell phone, right? Remember, you ever seen one of these? This is a flip phone. You know, this is 15 years old, but I just can't get rid of it. I'm a technophobe, but I do have one of these, okay? These are both, quote, telephones, right? But this telephone has, what, 100 times the computing power that this does, right? But the CPI says these are the same things. That's why, by the way, these numbers that say that the average American doesn't have a higher living standard is nonsense, because everybody has access to so much better stuff today than they did 50 years ago. But in any case, so, you know, you're seeing that the the cost of these things is falling over time. And that's due to two things, right? What, what causes those things to fall in price? Technology, right? The technology gets better. And trade. One of the benefits of international trade is it creates more competition which drives down prices. That's why free trade is so important. So in most consumer areas, prices are falling. You know, food's gone up about the rate of the pr price index. Energy, this was before we had the big boom. Energy costs went up. But look at these two industries here. Look at those. Education and healthcare. Education and healthcare. Now, put on your thinking hats on this one. What do those two industries have in common? Industry. Government, right? <laughs> these are the two industries that are run by government, right? Education and healthcare. So <laughs> why is it that education, I mean, you would think, by the way, education costs should be dramatically falling, right? Because we're in a technological age, and then if any industry should be able to harbor the cost reduction effects of technology, it's education. And yet, <laughs> look at this, look at this. I mean, it's unbelievable, 130% increase in the cost of education. Healthcare, the same thing. I mean, 50% of our healthcare is controlled by the government and 50% is private, and the costs go up, 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 up. I always ask my more liberal friends, they're like, why does the government pay? Because you kept saying, you know, the government role in education. I totally disagree with that. The government screwed up our education system. I mean, right? I mean, when I ask, why is it does the government play such a big role in education and healthcare? You know what my liberals say, friends say? To make it more affordable. Gee, they're doing a great job of it, right? They're really making it more affordable. And, you know, it, with all the grants and scholarships that we give to the universities, um, what do they do every time, you know, your, the Pell Grants go up? What do you think the universities do? They just raise their tuition. <laughs> How does that make it more affordable? So they, we say, oh, we'll pay you $10,000 more for a student, and then they raise their tuition to $60,000. We'll pay $15,000, then they raise $65,000. It doesn't make it more affordable. And my only point is, how do we solve this problem? Get the government out of education. Why don't we just have a system where we give every single child in America a $20,000 grant or voucher and they can go to any school they want to? Why so can't we just do that? For a really quick clarification, 
Um, I meant primary education, right? So K through 12. Yeah. I think college is, you know, a yeah. whole nother issue yeah. altogether. But this is all, this is college and K through 12. But, but you know, and somebody answered me that question, because this is, a, I, I mean, I know a lot of you are, are more on the liberal side. Why, do we ha why don't we just give every child, whether they're black, Hispanic, white, poor, just give every child $20,000 and say, you can go to any school you want to. Why wouldn't we do that? Can anybody tell me why that's a bad idea? Really, I mean, I'd love to hear somebody say why that's not a good idea, because that's what I'm in favor of. Trump wants to give five million low-income black students in terrible schools a voucher so they can go to good schools, and the liberals are against that. I just, I don't even understand the logic of why anybody would be against that. Why don't we want to give every family the right to go to a good school? Does anybody? Please, I mean, seriously, I would love some <laughs> response to that. Go ahead, why? I don't know, I think one possible hypothesis is that even if you were to say the cost of education, in, assuming an entirely private system is now $20,000 and we were to fund that, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily easy for someone who lives in a dense urban area in chronic poverty to make their way to a better school when it's geographically isolated from where they currently live. Um, and secondarily, there's issues of brain drain where you know, maybe we then take the most talented students out of that you know, yeah. impoverished community and we yeah. move them to a charter school in a wealthier community. Now it looks like that underperforming schools performing even worse, when in reality we've just selected mm. out the best students and put them into yeah. a school where they're more likely to so, succeed. So, I mean, look, I, I think, don't you just think it's a right of, let's, let me even accept what you said. I don't agree with that, but let's say it's true. Why shouldn't just every parent have the right to send their kids where they want to go to school? You know, I mean, why shouldn't they want to? I mean, and you're right. There are some areas in the inner cities. If you do this, it's like, you know, look at what happened with, with all sorts of, like, you know, stores. I mean, if you provide the demand, the Catholic schools in Chicago and Washington, D.C., because I'm Catholic, I know, I know this. The Catholic schools provide a better education for the children in Chicago and Washington, D.C. at one half the cost. One half the cost. So, you know, giving more and more money isn't going to necessarily solve the problem. How is it the Catholic schools can do it for $12,000 a student and the kids in the public schools get $24,000 per, per student and they can't educate the kids? I mean, it's just, I just think it's a disgrace. When we talk about income inequality, we want to give, I want to give every single child in America the best possible education. I mean, my God, I live in Washington, D.C. Barack Obama sent his kids to Sidwell Friends, which is one of the best schools in the country. I talked to a lot of these low-income blacks. They go, why does he get to do that? He lives in public housing <laughs> when he was in the White House. I mean, why should Barack Obama be able to send his kids to an incredibly great school but the poor black kids with a single mom doesn't have, have a chance to do that. How is that fair? I mean, really, we should rethink entirely our education approach, because if we keep graduating kids from high school in the inner cities, they can't even read the degree, we have a big, big, big problem on our hands. And I think we've got to totally reconsider the way we do education. Um, one, one last question, then we'll stop. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sasha, yeah. and I want to thank you for coming uh, yeah. to speak with us about this topic today. So you gave a lot of uh, facts and figures about the economy, but something you didn't touch on is the extreme debt binge that has happened over the past 10 years. And this is something that I and I know others are very concerned about. So, sorry, let me just interrupt for one sec. When you did you say the debt binge? Yes, the debt you, binge. And what you mean like debt of government or? That's what I'm about to get to if you, if you allow me to. Keep yeah, going okay. here. Sorry, go ahead. I what just I'm, want to what make I'm sure I understand what you're most, about. most concerned about is in the corporate credit market and you know the auto loan market and in the student loan market. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, is your team and the White House sort of at all focused or concerned about this? Because as we know, every single recession is preceded by a huge debt binge. And so is, your, is the administration focused on this? And if so, what are they doing to sort of... Well, again, um, which... I just want to make sure what debt you're talking... Are you, like, for example, you mentioned student debt. Yes, you want, yes. Let's, you want me to talk about that? that? Student, student loan, just okay. the overall well, debt binge that's right. been happening. I, so, I touched on student loan, audit loan, and the corporate credit market. Okay. So are you guys focused on that? Look, I, first of all, the cor corporate balance sheets are 
beautiful today. I mean, I, the numbers on corporate balance sheets are unbelievable. Co American companies are healthier today. Their debt burdens relative to their assets are actually low. They're not high. It is, it's true. I mean, you, you, by the, well, look at all the big corporate stock buybacks. What are they doing when they're doing that? They're increasing the value of their companies. I mean, companies are sitting on hordes of cash right now. I mean, it, there is no debt burden. The debt burden of companies has gone down dramatically over the last 10 years, dramatically. Now, on student loans, yeah, we got a big problem here. The single greatest scam in America is how much universities charge families. I mean, it's outrageous. The, uh, every single university in America should charge about half of what they do. It's outrageous kids are graduating from colleges with seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 of debt. It's outrageous. I mean, uh, my son um, just uh, last year, uh, was a, he's a freshman now at Northwestern University. Um, I don't I have, I have no idea what, and I'm not trying to disparage anybody, I don't I have no idea what the tuition is here. But at Northwestern, does anybody want to guess what it costs in tuition and all in for Northwestern for one year? $72,000. $72,000, that's thievery. I mean, that's stealing. How in the world can they get away with charging $72,000 a year? I told myself, I mean, think about this. Would it be better for a kid to go to Northwestern for four years for $72,000 a year or just give them $250,000? <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, the, the cost of tuition, I'm totally with you on this. The cost of tuition in colleges is totally outrageous. We've got to do something that every single university, especially the public universities, the state legislators have to start really looking at how they're spending that money and demanding that they start cutting their tuition for the families. Because it, it's bankrupting families. It's ba you can't start out kids with sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 of debt. We have to do things to reduce the cost of college in this country. And by the way, that doesn't mean college for free. I'll end with one, one story and then, by the way, you guys have been fantastic. I know that you don't agree with me on a lot of things. I, I really genuinely appreciate that you've been very considerate and to listen to my ideas, so thank you. Um, but, you know, there's, I went to, I, I probably give about 20 lectures a year on college campuses. Um, sometimes I get how, you know, shouted down and I really appreciate you guys have been very, um, very courteous. Um, but one school I went to, I mean, I go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Duke, you know, all, all the top universities, Claremont, great schools. And um, one of the schools that I went to was a little school, it's called uh, College of the Ozarks. Any of you ever heard of that school? A few of you have. Now, College of the Ozarks has an interesting model. And it, I mean, this is just a thought experiment for you all. So, does anybody want to guess what the tuition is each year, each year for, at the College of the Ozarks? Zero. There's no tuition at the college. Wow, how did, by the way, these kids were awesome. Most of them grew up in the Ozarks. They're the first generation in their family to go to schools. Great kids, I, I just fell in love with these kids. They were eager to learn, they were great kids. Their tuition is zero. You know how they did that? You know how they do it? Every student on campus works 15 to 20 hours a week. <gasps> 15 to 20 hours a week? You're gonna require a 20 year old to work? Oh my God, that's like a violation. of. Why shouldn't every student, college student in America just work 15, 20 hours a week and pay for your own damn college education? Right? Think about that, okay? Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you.